a fresh set of test data was being prepared by Tom. Whether he liked it or not, he was correlating and tabulating data for analysis, which was a tedious but necessary part of the month-long effort he and his team had put into the test vehicle. A notice alerted him through his phone. Despite seeing the screen flash, he failed to detect the sender's name. He finally glanced up from the screen after waiting a few minutes when he noticed a gap in the data. He took out his phone and examined the alert. Even though the area code was local, he was unable to identify the caller and the number was not in his contacts. Before deciding to delete it as spam, he briefly considered opening it to see whether it was from a teammate whose phone number he hadn't stored. The message appeared on his screen as soon as he clicked on the text who would send him a sexy image. He was puzzled at first. Very explicit images had been captured on his phone, making his presence obvious. The message said, look closely. You still have time. Bradley's. Six. Six. Zero PEM. In his text message reader, he gave it another look. He considered it for a second, then let out a small laugh. It's not often that you get the sex number wrong. He was about to delete it when he glanced at the image again and his heart froze. He reread the message. He and Tanya hadn't been to Bradley's, a neighborhood watering hole. Tanya was en route to Boston, but why was Bradley's at 6 p.m. in the neighboring town? A major proposal was being prepared by her team. On Monday, following lunch, the pitch was supposed to take place. The entire squad flew in today. Tomorrow, they'd get together to polish the pitch. And on Sunday, they'd have a full dress rehearsal before the big game. Naturally, Tanya was present to prepare since she was a principal. The time was 5, 15 p. M. M. At 4, 30, she was supposed to touch down in Boston. It was reasonable to suppose that she was occupied with gathering the team and their gear before they departed for the hotel, since she always calls as she lands. Prioritizing responding to the Sims above making a phone call was his decision. Not very creative, but totally anticipated. Who is this? How did you get this picture? Am I supposed to meet you at Bradley's? He started gathering his day pack. He had already made up his mind to visit Bradley's. Somehow, he was bound to receive a response. He wanted to keep it low. Key, while he tried to figure out what was going on, so he contacted Tanya and said, How was the flight? I'm heading out for a bite. Give a call when you're free. As he made his way to his vehicle, his phone beeped once again. Thinking about Tanya, he took out his phone. The unknown caller's reply was sent by text message. I'll be there but I'm sure you will find someone more interesting than me there. He was now completely disoriented. Quickly pulling out his phone, he walked briskly to his car. The time was 5.40, and Bradley's was 30 minutes away. Just after 6 o'clock in the evening, he would arrive. He would just head straight there and cross his fingers that he would be punctual for whatever the texter thought he would find intriguing not realizing how important timing was. During the journey, his phone buzzed once more. Tanya was the victim this time. He didn't give it much thought because they would talk later. Crazy time with the team. Call you later before bed. Love you. His meeting at Bradley's and the texter's acquisition of such detailed knowledge about his wife piqued his interest more. At 6, 12, he pulled into the parking lot, his heart racing. Since the texter never specified who he was seeking, he naturally thought that anyone was interested in seeing him here was already familiar with him and would get in touch. His biggest worry, though, was the remark about someone more intriguing being present. He felt like he was stepping into a trap, but he couldn't come up with any other method to find out what was going on, and the texter clearly knew stuff he didn't. This picture made him feel a variety of emotions. At least in his mind, their sex life was perfect, and he trusted her unconditionally. In five minutes, however, he was going to have to figure out how someone could get a picture like that, and the prospect of a definitive answer to that question filled him with dread. He stepped inside and adjusted his gaze to the dim light. 
Since he was unfamiliar with the tavern and its layout, he paused briefly beside the entrance to survey his surroundings. On one side, he could see a spacious dining area, and on the other, a bar. He strolled up to the bar, where he settled onto a seat towards the far end. The barman approached Tom to collect his order after finishing one for a well-dressed patron. He returned his gaze to the eating area after requesting a draft. As he crossed the dining room floor to join a group of happy diners, his attention was captivated by the man who had just accepted his drink order. Then he noticed the person the texter had mentioned, Tanya, who was smiling and looking absolutely stunning in her little black dress and pearls. Sitting at the table, taking a drink from the well-dressed man, he was completely unfazed. He rose from his seat and made his way to the table where Tanya was sitting. She noticed him while he was just two steps away. She shifted from a grin to a terrified one. There was no let-up in his upward momentum. Tom reached the table and, using his left hand, snatched a fistful of the man's well-coiffed hair. The well-dressed man tipped over his drink, skidded backwards, lost his footing, and yelled out in agony as he retreated hard. Tom was about to land a right cross to the man's face when he caught sight of the man's rapid rearward movement and realized he was out of range. The man collapsed backwards before Tom could continue to fight him. He walked over to him and recognized him immediately. Tom said, Stay down, Pete. From his alcohol-soaked suit, which was lying at Tom's feet, the once well-dressed Pete peeked out and said, I'm serious. He remained still and silent, only nodding. Tom turned back to Tanya. There was complete silence at the table. They were all Tanya's team members, and he knew a few of them from their frequent visits to his house for team gatherings and barbecues. With the exception of one individual I suppose team loyalty trumps infidelity, he reasoned, there was someone right in front of him who was aware of the facts and chose to inform him. After a brief consideration, he concluded that it wasn't worthwhile to pursue the matter of identifying the person. She nodded and began to stand up, but he raised his hand to restrain her. I'm going home. If you expect any chance at saving our marriage, you'll come home now. He glanced over to Betty Wilson, who was sitting next to Bob Thornton, and said, Better to give me a moment to leave. Prior to turning to leave, he looked over at Billy. They avoided meeting his gaze and responded clumsily to his question. Betty, does Bill think you are in Boston too? Bob, is that what Alice thinks? Is everyone on the team shagging? He wondered. He was aware that one of them was. Unfortunately, it was second nature to drive home. Before he knew it, he was in his driveway, which appeared to catch him off guard. Unlocking the door, he reached into the refrigerator for a beer and settled into the living room. He was acquainted with Alice Thornton and Bill Wilson. Neither of the other two pairs was familiar to him. There were a total of four couples present. He couldn't decide between Bob and Alice to call. While he was realizing he didn't want to chat or know anything, he noticed that Bob and Betty were lying there, assessing the situation. In the end, he opted to send them a text message. A brief message was sent to them both by him. Now that they know something is wrong, they can decide whether to look into it further or not. At least his conscience was clear after hearing from Tanya that the team's travel plans appeared to have changed. The best thing to do is contact to obtain an update. After waiting for about 20 minutes, he finally heard Tanya pull into the garage and open the door. Waiting for him was the living room. She entered the room in her little black dress. Elb, but her jewelry and come-to-me shoes were missing. She entered the living room and sat down on the sofa across from him, appearing composed. While he waited for her to start, he remained silent. He was aware that remaining silent may be an effective strategy in any conversation. For as long as it required, he would allow the quiet to settle in. It was done quickly, as if Tanya were about to explode. She started by saying, it's not what you think. To signal for her to remain silent, he raised his hand. You have absolutely no idea what I think about what I saw tonight, replied Tom. I don't want a big backstory. 
We're both engineers. I think you know as well as I that there is no real or objective answer to any why question. Inevitably, it's just a rationale to mitigate the bad results. So, I won't even ask why. Let's start with something easier. How long? How many? How often? Do our friends know, aside from the other cheaters at the table? Am I known as your cuckold amongst your work colleagues and our friends? Tanya firmly stated, No, Tom, it's not like that at all. Because of the disruption to our trip plans, Pete proposed that we remain in town and rest for a day. Before we set out again, instead of returning home and starting again tomorrow, the entire squad wasn't visible to me. Has anyone else shown up? Tom inquired. When we got the word, some of the team elected to stay at home one more night, then meet us at the airport tomorrow. According to her, he pointed out that you appeared to be quite close to Pete, and he stated, but you decided to lie to me. Is there anything you would like to share with me regarding the star engineer's relationship with the Wonderkind program manager? According to her optimistic statement, well, for starters, Pete's all right, and he convinced the owners at Bradley's not to press charges. I could care less about your boyfriend, she said, her loyalty obvious in his wide eyes. If that moron hadn't tripped over his own feet, I would have shattered his nose. By the way, the jury is still deliberating on that, Tom remarked. Let him press charges. I've been to jail once for the night. I am not frightened by it. Do you love him? He asked with a hint of a smirk. You have to admit, it will make for compelling testimony. Tanya remained still for a while, as if she were collecting her thoughts. He could feel her mind racing to fill in the blanks she left in the discourse. Things were clearly not going to turn out well. He's not the person I'm seeing. There is utterly no activity. Whether I was in town or in Boston, it felt insignificant. You weren't expecting me, and I was still dedicated to the team. So, yes, I should have informed you about the trip arrangements. Our only intention was to have dinner and then go to bed. He was merely bringing a round of drinks. There was no justification for your behavior. In front of my entire crew, you completely humiliated me. She had gone into full-on bluster mode trying to bully her way out of a sticky situation. After accessing the message, he slid his phone over the coffee table and handed it to her. He could see from her expression that she had recalled the photo and the situation. He could also tell that there was no denying it. She started over, but this time she didn't use as much bombast. He took his phone from the table, launched an audio recording app, and slipped it into his shirt pocket. Our team is in many ways very cohesive she said, pausing to find the right term. I belong to a small group that gets together on a regular basis, she began. Everyone had converged to Bradley's. We were the ones who charged the proposal's batteries the hardest and brought in the most water. The amount of time I've spent working on our pitch is obvious to you. After Pete became prime minister, I'm not sure when it all began. According to Tanya, it just happened that they worked closely together and that she was attracted to him. Cheating is never casual, he told her. There's no why. Things have to be undressed first. We both realize the choice is made consciously, so please don't take offense at me. So, almost six months, he said in response to one of his inquiries. Isn't that when Pete joined on? Her expression was one of agreement. The team... He began once more. You all? He allowed the idea to wander without naming it. Are you referring to everyone here? Pete said it was good for building trust and team dynamic. She nodded again. I agreed with him. I thought he was trying to talk you into starting a business team, right? This is quite rude of you. That is just the tip of the iceberg. Now, more than ever before, I have an incredible bond with Pete and my staff. Tanya's bluster was resurfacing, and he had a sinking sensation that things weren't going to go properly. Sorry to say, you might be seeing some personnel changes on your team, remarked Tom. So, what's your plan? Tanya let out a gasp. Tom, 
If you tell anyone else, it will lead to many more casualties. We need to accept ourselves, so let them make their own choices. Tanya, you must understand that my silence cannot be seen as a complicit act. Bob and Alice are wonderful. I texted them that our travel plans seem to have changed. Actually, I am liking them a lot more than Betty and Bill right now, he continued. The way your friends respond to their wives, and the way their wives take those responses, is totally up to them. Once I make a decision, I can rest easy. Tom, our team is the most productive team in the history of Cromerica Inc. She practically yelled at me. And you've been at an advantage too, mister. You weren't left to your own devices just because our team planning meetings were held on Wednesdays. You were never denied access to me. I was always there for you. Would you like to know more about the picture you showed me? Right after Pete shot me with the shotgun, she began to frown. Yes, it's true that Pete betrayed your devoted wife. Betty is missing from this photo. It couldn't have happened without you knowing about it, could it? Hearing the breadth of the deception and the depth of my own ignorance left me speechless. So now you're going to trash everything that my team and I have achieved simply because you know, because your ego is hurting? Tanya, who was already furious, let out a hiss as her anger grew. The tension was building, and Tom's heart raced as Tanya defended her team's lurid dynamic, a defense that made him even angrier. On the way home from Bradley's, he briefly considered the possibility that Pete could forgive him if it were just this one time. However, that thought had long since died a violent and quick death, and he no longer wanted or needed to hear her defense. So she continued, No way, sir. We'll make sure you pay for it. We're stuck in Atlanta, but we had morning orders, so you'll write Bob and Alice to let them know what you've heard from me. You'll support Betty and Bill's story, so please reach out to me. Your insults mean nothing, she shouted. There are tens of millions bet on this deal. Please send a text so we can discuss future management strategies. Can you handle what's next? Going forward, there's no way to manage it, Tom yelled. So, you've decided to depart, right now. Feel free to continue as you like with your six squad and leader Pete. We finished. I will locate a lawyer this week and set everything up. We can just divide our retirement funds 50-50, Tom remarked. But go. You keep yours, and I'll keep mine. In this town, you have reservations. Take use of them. Make your way to Boston and bring home another incredible victory for your squad. Tom, I'm begging you, Tanya pleaded in a much softer voice. The company stands to lose millions if we lose Betty or Bill before the presentation. Please send these messages. We risk losing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in bonuses and commissions. Imagine how many amazing things we could buy with that money. Put that behind us, because it's just you and me. We shouldn't let irrational feelings about sex get in the way of our plans, Tom. If I can maintain my current level of production for a few more years, Pete says I'll be promoted to management in no time. For me, don't you want that? As for you, she asked. Just as he was about to respond, Tanya, just leave. He took a heavy blow to the back, sending him down to the floor on his knees. According to Tanya, don't hurt him, she went on to say, too badly. Oh. The verdict on breaking my nose is still out, isn't it? While I lay crushed to the floor, Pete leaned down and placed his face on top of mine. Tanya must have a transmitter, Tom thought to himself. So now I know whose team she's batting for. Let's see who gets their nose broken. Pete glared. Take his phone and type those texts for him. We don't have time to wait. Someone lifted him off the ground, but it was only one person. He had deliberately feigned injury so that the person behind him would have to exert a lot of effort to lift him, which gave him some useful information. His captor was a weak office idiot, and he was wheezing from the effort it took to lift Tom. Tom was recovering from being sandbagged and had shifted his attention. 
Unlike Pete and his team of manicured salespeople, Tom's team worked in the field with the 160th soar out of Eft Campbell, Kai. Oh, his group of engineers weren't anywhere near their league, but in spending time with the crews while working test missions, the team were invited to work off their Pillsbury doughboy bellies under the tutelage of some hard-hitting workmen that were flown to missions in the aircraft his team modified just for them. The master sergeant was revered by all who knew him, from bootlickers to bird colonels, for the respect he had earned leading his men on missions across the globe. His reputation for never leaving anyone behind was solidified during an operation in Colombia, where he instructed the young lieutenant platoon leader to remain close. This was the lieutenant's first mission, and Miss Gat Baker thought he was doing well for a rookie. However, the FARC ambushed their group, and they managed to fend them off. But when he glanced over, he saw the lieutenant lying wounded, bleeding profusely from a head wound, and the medic exclaimed, He's gone top. The medic was taking vital signs. A fireman's carry was quickly employed by Baker as he was lifted up onto his knees. He's gone top, exclaimed the medic once more. He only remarked, that may be. Despite this, the medic gave him an insane look and said, but he's still coming home with us. What on earth was the top brass thinking? The return journey to the LZ through the thick woodland was already going to be a challenge, let alone lugging a dead body. He was mined, read by the Meski. I would go to the same lengths for you, Billy, he informed the medic. Stay close in case I need you. People still talk about what happened. As the chopper touched down at the base, the doc received them upon their return. As the medic told the doctor, the Lelt was the one who purchased it. With a nod, the doctor reached into his pocket and produced a penlight. The medic was astounded to see the pupils of the Dedalts constrict under the intense penlight. The doctor asked the medic, Would you be willing to change your diagnosis, doctor? As they hurried the revenant leaped into surgery, he seemed to have stood the test of time. He was quiet most of the time, but when he did speak, everyone paid attention. He embodied the past. During that time, he was neither inexpensive, easy, or disposable. Tom and his crew appeared particularly fond of him because of his unusual appearance and the fact that he was hand-built. The master sergeant shown his gratitude during the lengthy periods between missions by instructing Tom and the team in simple yet efficient hand-to-hand -hand defensive methods. He advised the engineers to be well informed in case something unexpected happens. I know the biggest threat you're likely to face is a jammed copier or a nasty paper cut. But if you stay in this business, you will find yourself traveling to some colorful places. So, now, if you happen to meet one of the local colorful natives, you'll have something useful to fall back on. Miss Gott Baker explained to the group, but let's hope the paper cut is the scariest thing you ever have to face. Tom relaxed his breathing and collapsed into his captor's arms giving the impression that he was in control. The battle tactics the junior sergeant had taught them were starting to become more and more a habit. Tom remembered the lesson and passively resisted his captor, gradually draining his strength. You might find yourself in a position where there's not much you can do, but take the hit. Yes, it happens. The important thing to remember is that even when you get hit, you can still fight back. You just have to be smarter than the person hitting you. Tom, give me the phone, Pete demanded, staring at it. Look, now you know I slept with your wife. You're just another wimpy frigging nerd. Do as we ask, and maybe you can be with Tanya when the team isn't using her. Don't forget the toys you can buy with her premiums. It'll soften the spice of the experience a bit. Tom refrained from saying anything as Pete relished the opportunity to shame him into submission. He pointed to his shirt pocket and inquired, Where is it, Tom? As he could barely make out the shape of the phone. He sighed and extended his right hand to grab it, saying, Ah, there it is. With a forceful stride back, Tom's right heel struck his captor's shin halfway up and pulled it down till he slammed down on his toes which were covered in Gucci loafers. As he yelped in agony and collapsed beneath a leg that could no longer bear his weight, 
he flexed his arms and freed himself from his captor's grip. In a moment of awareness, he witnessed Pete's eyes widen. As the junior sergeant demonstrated, he extended his right arm forward and twisted his shoulder, then slammed his fist into the center of Pete's face. Pete collapsed to the floor, blood gushing from his nose. Looking back, he wanted to know who had grabbed him. Who was that? Bill. With his leg held up, he lay on the floor, sobbing. He said, I think you broke my foot. As a result of Tom's heavy footfall, Bill let out a scream of agony, Tom declared. That should remove all doubt. Pete lay on the floor, hands raised to his face as he struggled to get to his knees, as he turned around to see him. He approached him, knelt down to him, and placed his face close to his ear. Looks like your nose got broken, Pete. I'm just not willing to take a stand, he replied, striking him once in the temple. Pete lost his footing. As he searched the living room for Tanya, his heart raced and his breath came out in harsh gasps. A sharp blow to the nape of his neck and the center of his back hit him at that very second. In order to deal with the new threat, he knelt down and whirled around. Tanya was holding a cast iron skillet when he glanced up. Instead of hitting Tom square in the face, she barely grazed him. He stood up and forcefully yanked the pan from her grasp. Her words were, Tom, we can still make this work. Think of the money you'll be throwing away. I'll stop all the extra sex. I'll cut them off, I promise. Just you and me like old times, Tom. As he stared at her, his left palm caressed the back of his head, astonished by the speed with which she transformed from Tanya to someone else. For a moment, he recalled the shape, shifting alien in John Carpenter's The Thing and how it adapted to new threats. The idea made him smile. Tanya went to embrace Tom, assuming his smile meant he was giving in to her newest pleading. To keep her at arm's length, he lowered his left hand from his neck. Then, without missing a beat, he raised his right fist and punched her in the nose, a force that would break bones, but not put her to sleep. Tanya fell to her knees and sobbed. It hurts so bad, doesn't it? Tom inquired. Eyelids swollen. Vision impaired, respiratory distress, and blood everywhere. Resolves every time. Then why did you strike me? She sobbed. He said, cause I could. He was still recording on his phone, and while not all of the evidence was favorable, he believed he had enough to back up his statements. He took stock of the room and recalled the advice of the Miscat. Make up your mind when you can act and don't move till it's right. But once you do, commit everything and don't stop till there ain't no one moving but you. He glanced around and saw that, aside from Bill wimping in the corner and Tanya struggling to contain the blood oozing from her nose, no one else was doing anything. You saved another one, Top, he thought to himself. It appears that you, the lover boy, and Mr. Bill will not be able to pitch on Monday. The misfortune of not winning those millions in huge bonuses is unbearable. Well, I'm curious to hear Art's reaction when he finds out, Tom continued. He thought about dialing 911, but decided against it since he wanted to be sure he could interview Tanya before the cops arrived. He went over to where she was sitting, where she had a dish towel covering her face, and kneeled down next to her. Pinch the bridge of your nose with your thumb and index finger, in the same way, he demonstrated it. His energy level plummeted as the adrenaline hit rock bottom, and he slumped into a hard seat across from Tanya, wondering where his wife had disappeared to. The Tanya he'd known for years was clearly not the one sitting across from him, and he pondered once more how she'd managed to fool him so completely. Was it worth it? For his part, he inquired. If you had simply gone along, Tanya said him, shaking her head in disapproval. It could have been. We weren't even close. I was planning to visit the executive suites after Monday. I will be hindered by this. Even if I solve it, it will be a setback. So, becoming vice president was your only goal? And what about us? Tom asked. How long would the infidelity and deceit persist? You're so innocent, Tom. 
I knew it, Pete. He warned me that your fundamentalist beliefs and emphasis on boys' rights would stunt my growth if I let them. He warned me that if I wanted to succeed, I had to become my own woman and get out from under your control. You don't know the half of it. I tried to be a good girl engineer and do all the things you said would help my career. Would you like to know the truth? Tom remained silent. Sometimes you have to step aside when someone intends to blow themselves up. He continued to take notes. My dear husband, I must confess that nothing you suggested was effective. Despite my best efforts, I was only rewarded with a handful of Atta girls for completing my assignments on time and within budget. It wasn't until Betty pulled me aside that I discovered the true path to success for women. I can assure you that frigging your way to the top is not only effective, but also far more enjoyable and easy. So, this has been ongoing prior to Pete's arrival, right? Tom inquired. She said, Oh, for a smart engineer, you can be awfully slow sometimes, Tom. Wait, are you also taking advantage of the boss? Art? Art Vandelay? Tom said in shock. Yeah. Tom, Art, Pete, Bill. Anyone who can help me in my career. It costs me nothing to flirt a little and then you are very easy to manage. I'll direct you where I need you to go on my own, in her words. Even now you think you have it all figured out, and yet we told Art where we were going when we set out here. He's gathering the rest of the team now. They will be given the legend of our absence. They'll have to bid without us, but I think the extra effort we put in with their purchasing managers will pay off. Thinking, Am I really interested in hearing this? He asked himself. Extra effort. Tom poked. And the word, why not, escaped Tom's lips? You always were a go-getter, Tanya. That was so easy. I don't even want to call it effort. She giggled. It was so easy with the men at the applicant conference that we had to get more creative with Brenda, the token woman on the selection committee. Funny how I can even seduce a woman but I had to get old man Pete to do it. She was situationally, be curious, and given the promises that we'd start working together after the contract was finalized. Yeah, we got a selection committee. Why all this then? I mean, if it's all greased, why the strong arm stuff? Replied Tom. It was Pete's idea. Dumbass. I told him to chill out, that I'd come home suck you off and be back in time to catch a plane. But he had to go to Alpha. Look what that got us. Now, instead of being the face of the winning team, I'm now going back many steps. You wouldn't have bought me so cheap, according to him. No, Tanya said. But I still would have made the flight. Well, you sure as hell ain't making that flight now, he informed me. Given Pete's apparent telepathic abilities, he reasoned that Tanya must be carrying a transmitter. Art, Art, are you listening? I'm about to call the cops. I'm sure there's a handful of felonies involved here, and we haven't even begun to go down the rabbit trail of fraud. That's a federal contract, isn't it, Tanya? Tom questioned in jest. Yeah, the feds take a dim view of how. Did you phrase it? Additional effort? I'm sure you have excellent legal representation, Art. But could you consider another option? He then left it hanging, as Hail to the Chief began to play on Tanya's cell phone ringtone. The arts. Absolutely, she inquired over the phone. You'll be placed on speaker. And you, Tom, through the speaker, Art's voice ascended. First, allow me to apologize to you. Pete completely lost his bearings. You have my word that the board will take strong action against him. I appreciate it, Art. My worries have been alleviated. That fraud are such severe issues is encouraging to see. Tom, these accusations are quite sad. Legal professionals will amass vast fortunes, and nobody wants to cause a stir. In the end, you will be divorced and half poorer, Art remarked in a businesslike manner, adding that we might pay a fine and Pete and Bill might get some community service. Art, is there a or somewhere in this story?
Tom inquired. Tanya has consistently claimed that you are the more intelligent one. Having employed Tanya, I am still happier. Truthfully, Tom, there is undeniably a or. Art continued. Tom, we, Cremerica, have displaced you in your wife's affections, and when you found out about this and questioned it, you were treated in a most shabby manner, Tom interjected, calling it most shabby and shocking. Tom, Art continued, I just sent a snap to Tanya's phone. Not me, but one of my it boys here. And they told me that they disappear after viewing. Have a look. Maybe that can fix our relationship instead of calling the cops, as you phrased it. The snap was opened by Tanya, and Tom was shown, on the screen, the words Bank of Grand Cayman, followed by a significant number. When exactly would that be paid in? Tom inquired. Tom, it's already at that spot. You have received an email containing the account number. Unfortunately, Tom today has been a rough one for you. Tanya is an attractive woman, so I understand that this is a difficult choice for you to make. But after all, you can't count on your emotions, can you? One cannot, Tom concurred, adopting Art's elitist, stilted speech pattern. Crampano will pay for your divorce. I think we can all agree that reconciliation is impossible. It will be Tanya who files. Her retirement funds and personal possessions will be requested by her. He paused to consider his options before responding. On the one hand, he could stick to his principles and expose the whole sleazy situation, letting the consequences follow. On the other hand, he could simply abandon the situation altogether. Art had just provided him with five million reasons to do just that. Art, is there a medical team at Cremerica? Tom inquired, and Art said, Ah, yes, Tom. I believe we have some physicians on retainer. Good, Tom remarked, and Art should have loaded up a couple into a limo and sent them over here to collect their squad. Are we in agreement then? Tom asked. Tanya, who? Art inquired. Exactly, Tom responded, and Art nodded in agreement. Are we through, Tom? Goodbye, Art, Tom murmured before cutting off the connection. Art promptly asked. I knew you would see it our way, Tom, Tom said as he put his phone back into his pocket, after removing it and disabling the recording app. We can still be friends, or at least be friends with benefits, after this is over. She forced herself to smile, but her irresistible grin couldn't hide her broken nose. Her darkening eyes, the crust of blood under her nose, and the dried drips that reached her chin. Tom smiled at the sight, finding it comical. Tanya mistook his smile for agreement and leant in for another kiss. Either I hit you too hard or not hard enough, she said as she thumped her foot on the couch, and Tom reached out to stop her with his right hand, cupping her face and pushing her back. Where on earth would Tanya be a good candidate for a kiss? Hurt? She raised her eyes to see his. As Tom headed for the door, he stopped next to Bill and asked, Does your leg still hurt? Take whatever you want, but make sure it's not here tomorrow. Hell, yeah, it still hurts. He, he asked, Maybe this will distract you, Tom replied, hitting Bill between the legs. Bill snickered and groaned, walking over to a rising Pete. Pete raised his hands to defend himself and declared, No more Toms. Tom assured Pete, I'm not going to hit you, Pete. Pete grinned, but his expression quickly changed as Tom's foot pressed down on the tissue that made up Pete's testicles. Pete rolled onto his side, and Tom left the room. With no clear destination in mind, he hopped in his car and drove out of town, stopping at a takeaway joint for a burger and a red roof inn next to the highway. As soon as his head hit the pillow, he dozed out. In spite of the aches and pains caused by a hundred or more, different insults to his body, he got out of bed early the following morning and made coffee in the motel room when his phone beeped. It was a message from the number, and he opened it right away. Apologies for yesterday. It is possible for us to meet. Hope you can make it to the mall by midday. 
I'll signal for you to take a seat at the bar. Yep, I'll be there, he thought, as he set up his laptop. Time for some online banking. He texted back and poured the lukewarm brown water from the coffee maker carafe into the paper cup. Tom had an economics professor in college long before he met Tanya. The professor strongly encouraged students to start an offshore account for emergencies. With nothing to lose, Tom took his advice and soon became the proud owner of a brand new bank account in the Caymans. Oddly enough, he had opened it ten years ago, proudly funding it at every opportunity. Now his fund was about to receive a huge boost. After opening the encrypted websites of each bank, Tom transferred the majority of Cremerica's payment into his personal account using his passcode and a few keystrokes, leaving $100,000 in the original account. He showered, changed, and got ready to meet the anonymous texter. A man, approximately Tom's age, attractive and well-dressed, waved him in as he entered gift shortly after noon. Tom approached the man and sat down, saying, I think you sent me a text. I'm sorry about how things worked out. I am not sure if there was a proper way to inform you. The stranger started. Why don't you start with who you are and your connection to Tanya? Said Tom. I played on the squad. After eight years, I decided to leave the army. After a lengthy rehabilitation from my wounds sustained in combat, I was medically released. Cromerica was my sanctuary over the past six months. Pete put me on his squad, approximately three months ago. I brought up the fact that I was working for Tanya while describing the position to a buddy. We found out we had a mutual friend when he asked for her complete name, and he asked me to be careful with Tanya. Everything seemed wonderful at first. The team greeted me with open arms. The reason for it was immediately apparent. He began. Around the two-month mark, Tanya approached me. She flashes a beautiful smile and says, I'm sure you're fine with the ring. Despite her irresistible charm, I asked her about her ring, and I made it clear that I wasn't. It was then when the deep freeze began. I received all the terrible assignments and nothing but criticism from Pete after I rejected her. I contacted our common acquaintance again and informed him about Tanya's approach to me. Speaking of you and your wife, he informed me that he found the idea of you selling her for money to be out of character for the man he knew. To him, it was important that you realize there was more going on than Tanya revealed. In an effort to get me on board with the team, Pete offered me the picture as a potential incentive for my cooperation. I have my reservations about their approach, to put it mildly. Apparently, I'm quite unwavering. Yesterday, I sent you a text announcing my resignation. And who was our friend? Tom inquired. Trinity Baker, he began. If I hadn't met Troy before pausing briefly before continuing, as a Greenlelt, I'll simply say he saved my bacon once. Two favors are due to him, don't we both? In agreement, Tom nodded. What are you going to do? May I inquire? The weirdo said. It was as if Art had mapped everything out for me, even though Bill, Pete, and Tanya might face legal complications if I called the police. His solicitors would ensure that these issues were only temporary setbacks. An agreement was reached between us. You may say I'm betraying you, and you could be somewhat correct. However, my one and only priceless possession was taken by them. The least I can do is make them pay if I am unable to do it lawfully. Tanya won't be brought back by it, but I might discover she's not as indispensable as I believed. My itinerary is all set. Acknowledge Troy's contributions. I have decided not to return to my job. Where do you stand? At last, Tom spoke up. Well, Troy always spoke highly of Baxter, Inc. Now that you're gone, they may just need another engineer. At Baxter, they do things a little differently, in my opinion. Perhaps more satisfactory to you. Quite demanding with ancillary benefits that pale in comparison to what Tanya's group was proposing. Thomas grinned. I think I can live with that. Somebody else stood up. Also, Tom did the same. They departed silently, after giving each other nods. The check 
in process for Tom's flight to Costa Rica, had just concluded on Monday. Tamarindo will be a nice place to decompress for a while, he pondered. As he approached security, he noticed a mailbox directly ahead of him. He retrieved an envelope from his pocket and sent it to the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. There was a thumb drive containing the audio file inside. Perhaps they would be intrigued, he pondered. Who knows? Maybe Art's lawyers aren't as good as he thinks. With the mail placed in the box, he proceeded to the security queue. Conclusion After a span of nine months, Tom returned to his regular spot at the cafe table. Anna, irreproachably charming, delivered his serviza. Thank you, dear. He then brought the bottle up to his lips and murmured. Yes, he had gotten mail. The envelope remained in his possession. Please provide a return address. Who found me? He pondered. Although he wasn't putting in any special effort to remain undetected, it would have needed extraordinary means to track him down to a small village on the Pacific coast in northern Costa Rica. It had occurred to him first that Art's followers had located him. For two days, he had led it to sit at his residence. One must exercise extreme caution. He was quite confident it was not a bomb at this time. Carlos, Tom shouted to the cafe owner. Tienes tu cuchillo. Si, Senor Tom. Tom handed over the envelope and retreated a couple steps. You can never be too careful. Opening the package, Carlos hesitated. Tom thanked him handing him the envelope. Flipping the envelope over, he picked up the bottle of beer again. Several pieces of paper fell onto the table. In his hands was a message. Thought you might be interested in this. The note only had a phone number instead of a signature. A single number. Troy has enough resources to find it, he reasoned. I can live with that. He turned over the second sheet of paper. A photocopy of an article from a newspaper was what it was. With their hands cuffed behind them, the shot depicted Pete, Bill, Tanya, and Betty being escorted from the Cromerica building. Article headline, Four indicted in multi-million dollar procurement fraud. He grinned. Maybe Art's lawyers aren't everything he thought they were. Since his Spanish was lacking and English wasn't commonly spoken, he developed the habit of saying this to himself. Even if it was only him babbling to himself, he enjoyed listening to English. Anna, otra cerveza por favor. While he displayed his depleted bottle, say, Mr. Tom, gracias, Anna. He sipped his drink, glanced out at the vast blue Pacific, and remarked as much. Tanya, who?